Welcome to Speaking of Business, conversations with Canadian innovators, entrepreneurs, and business leaders. I'm Goldie Hyder, President and CEO of the Business Council of Canada. Today, I'm speaking with Daryl White, CEO of the Bank of Montreal, also known as BMO. Before I sat down with Daryl, I talked with a lot of his friends and colleagues. They all described him as a generous and thoughtful leader with a fierce competitive edge. As you'll hear, he became CEO at a time of intense disruption in banking while facing incredible adversity at home. In this wide-ranging interview, he shares his outlook on competitiveness, global trade, and the role of purpose in business. I hope you'll enjoy our conversation. Great to see you, Daryl. It's nice to see you, Goldie. Thanks for doing this. Happy to do it. Friday afternoon, that too. I'm always happy to talk to you any afternoon. Well, we'll see how you feel about that at the end of it all. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we uh, start at the beginning? You're one year old as you were born in Scarborough and you moved to Montreal. So really, you're a Montrealer at heart. Mm-hmm. Take me through the mm-hmm. early days of uh, growing up in, in Montreal, growing up in Quebec, and talk about uh, you know your, your family. Well, I'm happy to. I had uh, what I thought about then and I think about now as a fairly typical and great childhood. I grew up in a great family. I was the son of a school teacher, mother, and a father who worked in an industrial supply distribution business, a successful business based out of Montreal, and um, grew up doing what kids do. I was I was uh, having a great time at home and playing sports and doing my best in school. What kind of sports did you play? I wasn't particularly great at any of them, so I decided that diversification was was, was the best <laughs> thing to do. So I played uh, I played lots of sports. Um, but, you know, when you grew up in Montreal in the 70s, uh, one team tended to win the Stanley Cup a little more often than anybody else. And so ouch. Having, uh, having that <laughs> Everybody experience. Everybody else ha- out there says, ouch. <laughs> having that experience, uh, I'll tell you, 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 when you're young and you don't know any better, you expect that that's what's going to happen all the time. So uh, you end up... Uh, having a great time watching watching the Canadians in the 70s and expecting that there's going to be another Stanley Cup every year. So at some point, you probably convince yourself that you're you're going to end up there yourself. But of course, those things don't happen. Well, you did, right? You, you ended up as a director of the Montreal Canadiens board. Well, I did, in a, I did in a very different way. Can't play on the ice. You might as well play in the boardroom. You got it. You got it. <laughs> Let's go back to, you know, as you were growing up, um, lots of interesting things going on in Quebec. You know, I mean, the FLQ crisis would have happened. We've been dealing with the whole uh, sovereignty and sovereignty association struggles. I mean, you were just a kid through all this, but any memories of that? And, um, you you know, I mean, how were you feeling at that time? You know, I I was just a kid. So I can't tell you that the, you know, the way we think about these questions today is the way you think about them as a kid. But you asked me the question, do I have memories? Actually, I do. I have vivid memories. I remember in the communities that we lived in, you know, people would spray paint on the walls, yes or no. And that would be their way of advocating for the referendum vote uh, that we that we had. Um, and so I remember at the time understanding uh, a little bit about what was going on and, and asking questions about why these things were going on. Um, and you do, you do end up having um, profound memories of the experience and also watching, having grown up in an English middle-class family in Montreal, but going to French school. Right. You're perfectly bilingual, right? Yeah. Yeah. Once in a while you find you could dust up a little <laughs> bit, but for the most part, that's, that's, that's true. And the reason that's true, by the way, is because I was, my parents had the, had the foresight. They didn't have to, they sent me to not an immersion school, but a fully French school. So I grew up um, with kids from English mother tongue households, French mother tongue households. And you start to very early Again, not really appreciating what's going on at the time, but you start to understand that there are very different perspectives on the same issue. And that's what that conversation was about, is about today, less so. But it's also what Canada's about, isn't it? You start to learn that there are very, very different perspectives. People can come from different perspectives as a result of their heritage or as a result of what their own parents think or believe or want. And so, yeah, I mean, you asked me the question whether I have memories of that. At the time, I probably thought that was just normal and happening everywhere around the world. But it was really interesting that it was happening where I was. And, and those memories are pretty vivid. Well, I'll return to that. Um, what did you want to be when you grew up? Say you're 12 years old. What were you thinking of doing with your oh, life? Oh, well, I think like every 12-year-old in Montreal. Starting time, center? I was, well, yeah, yeah, starting center. That would have been pretty good. <laughs> um, but that wasn't in the cards. Right. So what was your first job? My first job that anybody paid me for. Sure. Uh, the first time Those I got, are usually the good jobs. The first time I ever got a paycheck, I was an orderly in the Montreal General Hospital. So I was on point for 
everything from the medial jobs to responding to uh, emergencies in the hospital and dealing with whatever needed to be dealt with. It was great. It was fantastic. Right. So how does a kid who wanted to be the starting center for the Montreal Canadiens end up as the CEO of the Bank of Montreal? Well, that's a good question. I don't have a clear answer for you. I can tell you um, that I got into this business almost by accident. I didn't really have a full appreciation of what I was getting into. I got into the business in the investment banking side of the business. And when I was finding my way into the workforce, I would say to a whole bunch of people, I really don't know what I want to do because I'm interested in sales. I'm interested in finance. I'm interested to some degree in law and public policy and, and in human behavior. And that's quite a range. And I did have somebody one day say to me, you might want to try this investment banking advisory work. So I gave it a try. And then I asked people that I work with then, how do you succeed? And one fellow I worked for said, you know, if you're hardworking and you're loyal and you put the client at the center of everything you do, good things will probably happen. And that's something that I've always remembered. And I put those guidelines around most of my tasks through the course of my career. And, and here we are. But I can't tell you it was because of any grand design per se. I think this is a quote from you, but it reflects precisely what you may have just said, that as a CEO, you feel that you're a part-time financial expert, a part-time accountant, a part-time lawyer, a part-time psychologist, and a part-time coach. I think that's exactly right. You're always on, the pressure is always on, but you do have to have the agility to move through that range of tasks and skills and values, and you have to do it every day. Is it lonely at the top, as they say? No, I don't think it is. I actually think really? occasionally a decision might be lonely because if there's an impasse on the team, somebody has to call the shots and it's a democracy until it's not. But it's not lonely at the top most of the time because I have, uh, in my case, I have the benefit of an amazingly supportive board. I've got a management team that works around me that I've, I've cultivated and worked with very carefully. Um, we don't agree on everything, but we have a very close and regular rhythm that we work through problems on. So I would say 90% of the time, the answer is no. And then occasionally you got to make a call on your own and that's when it can be, but that's not, that's not the norm. Do you struggle with those human decisions impacting people's lives? Talent decisions are the hardest decisions to make. You know, if I think back to mistakes I've made, the largest ones are almost always around people, whether it be the wrong person in a certain chair or the wrong person, period. Um, so yes, how you develop people, how you develop your team, how you work together as a team, that's really hard. And I think people talk about that a lot. I would say to you over the course of my career, if there's something that you, you just can't invest enough in, it's, it's the file that we're talking about, you and I, right now, um, because the textbook doesn't really get you there. The finance textbook's really clear. You know, there's an answer. And on the issue of great talent management, I would say I, I spend more time on it than I do on an, anything else. And at the same time, uh, the answer to your question a few minutes ago is yes, it is, it is something you always struggle with. Right. Now, you've only been at this as CEO since uh, 2017, Late in yep. 2017, I yep. believe. Yeah, it's been so uh, it's 18, 19 yeah, months. 18, yep. 19 months. You added the title CEO to what you were doing at BMO. When that happened, anything changed for you? Did you look in the mirror the next morning and think, holy crap, I'm the CEO of Bank of Montreal? Like, how did you change as a person that day? We spent um, a year with me in the COO position, which in some ways was training wheels. I would encourage this, by the way. It's not the only way to do things. There are other ways that could work for other organizations, but for us, it worked very well. And I think that prepared me extremely well for the job. So I didn't feel like the day my business card changed, that at midnight, I was walking into some complete unknown or worse, some abyss. But I got to tell you, at the same time, your instinct to ask the question is right. It is different because, you know, everything I've just told you says that you're prepared. But there's some cold shower element to it, right? One of my uh, peers said to me, you know, you think you know a lot about what a cold shower feels like. That's great. But when it happens, it's actually still pretty jarring, isn't it? And uh, it is a little bit jarring. But when you prepare well, you skip through that and you just get to work. And you, you get to work and you start to get the job done. And and uh, I like to say I love my job most of the time. 
<laughs> and I do. I really do. I love my job most of the time. And there are times where it's hard and there's times where you wish you were doing something else, but that's life. You Starting center. Through that too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't think that's coming back. <laughs> so what has surprised you stepping into this role? You know, for almost 25 years at this company, there were a lot of corners of the bank that I didn't have direct exposure to. I had some familiarity with, some passing, some more deep. But intuitively, one might think that there are big differences across the organization. You might think that with an organization that has 50,000 people operating in 30 countries around the world, having built businesses, sometimes organically, sometimes by acquisition, that you would find really different cultures or really different answers to questions when you go around and do your listening tours and ask what's going well and what can we do better. And when I went around and did that and spent effectively the first six months of my mandate, I was, I would say to you, Goldie, almost shocked at the consistency of the responses. You know, these are the things that are going well. These are the things that we need. These are the things that we go better. And that would be the same if I was in the Midwest of the U.S. or in Western Canada or in Europe or in a business that we acquired two years ago or a business that we've been building for, in our case, our bank is 202 years old. And you'd think that it would be different, and it's not. So my learning and my surprise was organizations have identities. Don't they? They, they really do. They take on identities. And this can be good and it can be bad because if it starts to go the wrong way and the culture of the place spools itself up as an echo chamber, you have a problem to deal with. If the identity is a positive one and it's values-based, then you have an opportunity actually, and particularly in the day and age that we're in, and we can communicate more effectively and more quickly using all the channels that you have. So my big surprise was, wow, we have, we have such an amazingly consistent worldview and culture that the job is to figure out how to grasp it and figure out how to monetize it and make sure that you don't allow any negative snowballing to take over because it can so easily. Well, we'll come to the issue of disruption, but before I go there, you used the word identity. Um, unfortunately for you, you and I have a lot of common friends who know you very well. <laughs> And so I asked them about unfortunately you. For yes, me. unfortunately for you. So I asked them about what you. What lies did they tell you? Well, here's the interesting thing. It's, it's like the bank. There's a great amount of consistency on the range of people that I spoke with about you. And they said, uh, you will never meet a nicer guy. He's just a genuinely good guy. But there's another Daryl White, and he is an intensely competitive guy. And I was thinking about this it's kind of like an enforcer in hockey. Many enforcers are mean on the ice, but they're, in many cases, the nicest people you'll meet off it. H how do you reconcile that dichotomy that at least people see in you? Maybe you want to challenge that, but this is what people said about you. I'll take that. If that's the assessment, I'll take it. I would say I've always been a big subscriber to a values-based system that says you play within the rules and you absolutely maximize your chance of winning within the rules. And so I don't have a view that competition and being a nice guy are at odds. I think that they're completely aligned. And that's what I talk to my team about. We have rigorous discussions around our purpose as an organization, the work that we do for communities or customers or employees and aligning people around doing the right thing. And that's not just popular, it's actually real. But at the same time, we have a job to do to compete against others and to deliver for our shareholders. And yeah, if that means that I can be a nice guy and competitive all at the same time, I think your research is fine. I'll take that all day long. <laughs> so let's move, as I said, to the actual disruption that banking is facing. And it's not alone. There's a book uh, by Lou Gerstner, the CEO of IBM, when probably you and I were students. And it was uh, called, Who Says Elephants Can't Dance? Can BMO dance? Yeah, it can. It can. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, Goldie, BMO's 202 years old. So in some respects, you can come to that question with the point of view, and I can assure you some people do come to me with this point of view and say, well, you have to understand, Daryl, that this is an institution with 202 years of finely tuned process and procedure. <laughs> and you got to make sure 
that don't mess with it. You understand <laughs> that that's the wiring, uh, and that wiring can cause you to go at a certain pace. On the other hand, you mentioned fintech a couple of minutes ago. I, by the way, I think fintech has been such a beautiful thing to motivate the financial institutions space writ large. Uh, has caused us all to be better. It's caused us all to have our own fintech in incubators and to get stronger. And this next comment I'm going to make is not just about fintech, but it's about it's about innovation and challenging the past while honoring the past. For example, when a group of us got together and said, it's taking us 30 days. Imagine this, 30 days to approve a small business loan. So you have a small business in Canada, the engine of economic growth in Canada. You need a half a million bucks. And we say to you, thank you. Your package is complete. You've given us everything we need. We'll be right back to you in 30 days. Well, a couple of bad things happen then, right? First of all, it's horrible customer service. Secondly, you actually end up getting the wrong customers because the good ones will self-select to somebody who can do it in less than 30 days, which was pretty much everybody. So we said enough with 202 years of finely tuned procedures. Let's figure out if we can take 30 days to 30 minutes. And we did. We took it from 30 days to 30 minutes. So that's just one example. And you do that by having cross-functional teams at work with risk people and technology people and business people. You put them on it and you say, we're going to have a 10x outcome here, not just a marginal outcome. So we're doing that type of work. Driven all, by customer. Driven ultimately. by the customer need and the customer satisfaction. And we're doing that type of work all across the banks. So you asked me, can BMO dance? Um, BMO can dance. Uh, and it is starting to dance. It just needs is it slow dancing or jiving or what's well, it I don't doing? Know what kind, I don't know what kind of dance it is, but one of the things I've learned is it just like it needs a good DJ, right? You can't you can't expect necessarily the machine to start moving all by itself, but when you get the right group of people on the dance floor and you get the right song playing, the answer is absolutely. You can make some beautiful music. That's you great. Sure can. So one of the areas we uh, explore, given our, who our listenership is, is leadership. So let's pivot to that. How do you define a successful leader? The leaders that I've respected through the course of my career have never been the prototypical command and control paint by numbers leaders. It's never worked for me, frankly, from a followership perspective. And so when I look to what I think are great leaders today, they are collaborative, clear, able to set a North Star and get people aligned to it, but not because I'm the leader and I said so. Because there's a reason for it. There's a purpose. We're going to debate it. We're going to understand it. We're going to shake hands. In fact, we're going to shake hands and have a blood pact that we're going to get there together. And at the same time, if things change circumstantially, if the weather patterns change, we're going to get out an umbrella and we're going to change some of the decisions that we've made but we're going to work together on the problems. And that's, that's the way I've always been motivated as a follower. I like to believe on my best days. That's the way I lead as well. And fundamentally, I think this is a really important question you're asking because I think you're asking the question because it goes way beyond business. Our little bank is not the uh, prototype for your question. I think the world needs a lot more leadership. But by the way, what I didn't say and I didn't intend, is it's not just a bunch of people giving each other hugs and singing kumbaya. Clear direction, clear outcomes, but how do we get there with the benefit of the team's work? That's the hardest thing to do, but it always drives the best outcomes. Well, we'll come to the world because I'm saving the good stuff for the end. <laughs> Surely, though, there may have been incidences in your life where you've had to you know, make that decision contrary to the advice that you received. You've had to not necessarily pull rank, but assert a decision because you had to be accountable for it. How do you manage when that happens? You know that you're going against the grain, but it's the right thing to it's do. Very, it's very seldom that when you have a group of people who are subject matter experts, that you'll make a decision. It's very unlikely that you'll have to make a decision if you've solicited the opinion of five people and all five people said the same thing and you've said, you're going to say, no, I don't think that's the answer. I Let's say it's 2-2 two, two and you're the but fifth. That's what I, but that's what happens, right? Yeah. If it's 2-2 two, two and you're the fifth, to me, you have to go back to what's the question we're trying to answer. One of the most difficult things that I think happens when teams try to solve problems is people go in the direction of the question they think they want to answer 
or they may have an agenda or they may have a proclivity or they may have a certain bias that they're not even aware of. And when you are the split vote in a decision and you do have people who have different points of view, to me, you always have to, you have to recoil and ask yourself, what are we trying to solve? And if you're very clear for yourself on what you're trying to solve, and then you marry that up against what you've stated already as your objective, whether it's for your family or your company or your country or whatever, then you can come to that decision a lot more clearly. I find it gets really foggy when you don't step back and say, you know, what are we really trying to accomplish here? And does the decision of those two people further it or does the decision of those two people further it? And then you can make your call. And at the end of the day, you have to be accountable for your call, right? So what keeps you up at night? You know, standard question I know. But two teenagers. Two teenagers. Yeah, that's what keeps me up at night and a younger one to follow them along. Um, you know, other than that, I actually sleep. I, I do. I sleep pretty well at night. I'm told you go to bed at 1030 in that night. Is that really true? That is true. That's, that's 5.30 a.m. wake up. Let's just say those two numbers are approximately true. Approximately it depends, true. It depends on the day or what time zone I'm in, but that, I, I give that my best shot. And yeah, I, I seriously, I do sleep pretty well. I worry about things just like you do. And, uh, you know, the one that's at the top of the list, and I think it's at a lot of, top of a lot of people's list, is the is cyber threat. And, uh, you know, it's not like I can solve any of that in the middle of the night any night. So I go to sleep and I wake up in the morning and we all work on it again. And there's a whole list of things that you could spend a lot of time worrying about. But um, that's a scary one these days. So if you could go back in time and give yourself a piece of advice, your younger self a piece of advice, what would it be? Breathe. Breathe. My younger self. Sounds like a good recommendation. And, and, and my current self and probably your current self and probably a whole bunch of other people that you and I know. Um, I would say you do need to take time to reflect. You do need to take time to breathe, as I said earlier, and that can manifest itself in small things and big things, you know, small things. Take that hour a day and figure out how to get your head out of the moment to moment work and decisioning. Make sure you take that vacation. I could have done a heck of a lot better job at that if I go back. And I always th sort of think about the fact that on, on the airplanes, they always say, if anything bad happens, God forbid, you make sure you put the mask on yourself before you put it on the other person because you can't help others unless you take care of yourself. So I think, I think we do have to remember that because we're not going to be any good at these jobs if we don't, uh, if we don't do that. That's sound, uh, sound advice. Thank you. I mentioned the Montreal Canadian Board of Directors. What are you learning from that? And how does sports and business kind of take the issue of leadership? Are there similarities? Oh, there's lots. There's lots. I mean, it's not just a guilty pleasure. It's very interesting. First of all, I think it's a, it's, it's a fantastic franchise with a great leadership team, and I'm privileged to be able to hang around. But you asked about similarities. Of course, I think there are lots from competition to strategy, team building, as we talked about earlier, protecting a brand, figuring out how to work through more than the P&L, but the value system around the p &L. I think there's all kinds of similarities. Now, I've read that, um, you know, the bank investor calls and others, they focus in on productivity, the productivity challenges at the bank. I would argue that Canada has productivity issues yep. as well. Why do you think that's the case? And what can you do about it? And what can we do about it? I think that in, uh, in the case of the, of the national file, we have a responsibility as business people to assist our elected officials with productivity. And I think we could collectively do a lot better job of it. I think we have a lot to be proud of, but we also have an opportunity to influence policy and to help with process. Now, I'll give you, I'll give you one example, Goldie. You know, it was amazing to us. We were scratching our heads at how unlikely it is that a small or medium-sized business in Canada will turn its gaze to export markets. It doesn't, it, you know, it doesn't make sense. We've got great products. We've got great processes. And the federal government actually has pretty good support. Support. Yeah. And you could call it technology to assist in the export development of a small business. Is that it, just laziness? What is that? I don't know. I don't think it's laziness, though. I do think in some cases it's a lack of awareness or it's a lack that of... That there's a world out there beyond the United States? No, but there's a path to get there. There's a path to get to that world because it feels mm -hmm. foreign and it feels hard and it feels exotic and maybe I shouldn't even try. And so 
you know, as businesses, what can we do to help as big businesses? What can we do to help little businesses? So we said in this case, well, we have this thing called distribution. We're in just about every community in Canada with business bankers. Federal government, to go back to it, actually has a product. So they have a product and we have distribution. And why wouldn't we put these two thoughts together and promote the federal government's product through our distribution? So that's exactly what we're doing. And this is not in and of itself going to change the productivity challenge in Canada. But I think if all of us as business people started to think about how can we plug into this equation, either through influence on policy or practical solutions on outcomes like this one, we start to make a difference. Where we don't make a difference is just by sitting back and throwing stones and saying, we have a productivity problem. Right. Somebody else fix it. It's critical to our economy. Uh, it's critical to your own growth as a business to get these SMEs to diversify because the diversification strategy government has is not just about the large entities. No. Many of these companies, certainly the business council members are already global. The large ones have figured it out and have the sophistication and the resourcing, in fact, to do it. What we need to do is get the- Take them by the hand. The small Literally. businesses, which by the way, represent 90% of the employment growth in the country. This is where we should be investing. So if we can take them by the hand, as you say, and help, we should do that. But it's not government pointing this way and big business pointing this way. We need to hold hands and do it. Now, you and I were in Davos uh, together back in January. And I think one of the takeaways from this year's session was- um, the realization that while, you know, the business community has largely moved on, uh, you know, 10 years later from 2008, a lot of the public hasn't. There's still a lot of anger about 2008. And that is really the source of so much angst and the protests that we see from the yellow vests and, uh, you know, the rise of the right and yeah. Occupy a little while ago. What can we do to speak to people's angst and, and, and demonstrate to them that, we hear you. We as in business, what can we do? First of all, I think it's critical that we do because I think that the rise of the populist opinion that says that establishment is bad, that biz, big business is bad, and that it is not anywhere near a noble pursuit to go and try and attach yourself to whether it be government or big academia or at worst, big business, and oh my God, a bank. worse would be a bank. <laughs> um, I think this is really dangerous. I actually do think it's very dangerous because you and I could um, analytically figure out in about five minutes what the world would look like if these institutions went away and it would be horrible. It would drive people into poverty and it would have outcomes that would be catastrophic in so many cases. But nobody really wants to hear me say that. And so I think as a business community, we have a responsibility, in fact, to do a much better job explaining the virtue of what we bring to the communities. And at the Business Council, you and I have so many colleagues who do so much great work for the communities, whether it be in philanthropic work and the money they give or the development of people or the pursuit of the diversity agendas or the development of communities that we invest in and we try and we try and rise up, not just by throwing paychecks, but literally investing by having sleeves rolled up and fingernails dirty. I think we have a responsibility to do a much better job fixing the brand of big business. And if we expect that somebody's just going to figure it out because they're going to go and do a case study or someone else is going to come along and do it for us, we're foolish. And I know we don't, but I think we have, to, we have a responsibility to speak up. But to speak up in a way to say, we hear you, we understand why you're angry, to some extent that is justified, but look at all this, and this is what we're here to do. And if it weren't for global trade, the world's poverty level would be approximately twice what it is right now. You know, that's, that's analytically proven. Who's talking about that? Nobody's talking about that. And if people just get up, people like you and me get up and talk about their own product or their own service or their own share price and have nothing else to say, we'll, we'll not solve this problem. In fact, it'll get worse, and I worry about it a lot. And short-termism is a part of that problem, right? Between businesses and governments sort of focused on their quarterly cycle or their electoral or their election, cycle. Yeah. How can we and business and government work together to provide that leadership? Because I, I think we're missing the vicious cycle of this. All that anger and all that angst being you know, spewed out against you know, big business and elites and all of those, the, the institutions. You destroy, as you just said, all of that 
forget the angst. You're going to have a lot worse problems to deal with. And yet business and government is going to be asked to solve that problem too. What can we do to prevent it from becoming that It's a big challenge. First of all, um, not talking to each other is a problem. And so for the most part, I would would observe we do a good job, big business and government talking to each other. But certain times we just go back to our corners, don't we? And we're guilty in business and government's guilty in government at times of that. But we also have to recognize that in short bursts, you talk about short-termism, we could actually be at odds in this conversation. Because if a government is forced, is focused on election, and if the popular opinion is not aligned with business, government may not be that interested in a conversation that's supportive of big business from a public narrative perspective. And so I think this is something that you have to take a long view on. I think we have to collectively take a long view on how do we ensure, like facts matter a lot, and how do we ensure that there are better facts in the hands of government, in the hands of business, and academia, by the way, as well. I think that part of the triangle is really important. And I think the ability of some, not many, but some can poison a well, some academics to poison a well on this conversation isn't productive. And I think we at at business have responsibility to make sure that facts are better understood. You just referenced earlier community and and social good. There's been a lot of pressure mounting uh, from, you know, your shareholders and others, such as Larry Fink at BlackRock and, you know, Jamie Dimon and and just the pressure that's coming now to say, we have to do a better job on purpose. I think we agree that's a great thing or it's a good thing. What are you doing about that at the bank specifically? Okay. So when we talk about, when people talk about profit and purpose being at odds, I think that's hogwash. I think it's absolutely absurd because we can't further a purpose without the profit because we don't have the funding and we can't get to the profit without the social license to operate. So here, you ask me specifically, what we talk about here is growing the good in business and life. What does that mean? We have a responsibility to grow. We have a responsibility to surround it with what what is good in our bank, with our customers, with our communities, with our shareholders, with our employees. And we say that's not just in business. It's in business and it's in life. And so that means we take all of this very seriously. We don't believe that it's anywhere near at odds with our responsibility to shareholders to deliver the best outcomes that we can. And we challenge our management team every single day on how those two concepts can coexist. And and we're going to get louder on this. We're going to get a lot louder. On what kinds of issues? On community issues. When you look at the work that we're doing, for example, in Toronto on inclusive economic growth, which we've sponsored um, in a very active way, not just with dollars, but with people. We're convening tables of business leaders. We hope to literally raise the standard of living of communities as a result of this business-led. We're not doing that because the 20 business leaders that I called to come around that table expect that they're going to end up with more customers as a consequence of it. But if they have a healthier community, they certainly have a better prospect for their own children. We're doing it in other ways through the promotion of inclusivity for minority groups, the promotion of the gender agenda, which we are we are so far advanced on, but we still have so far to go. And that's really important to you. I know that personally. What, where does that come from? You know, I have two daughters and, uh, you know, I do believe if I go back to the early part of my career and I look at whether or not the opportunity for somebody who was doing exactly the same job as me and performing in exactly the same way was the same as mine. And I don't believe it was. I think that there were just too many obstacles and too many barriers. And the fact that the men were outnumbering the women by such a substantial margin back then, and I'm going way back, made it really difficult. I think it really made it very difficult. And so, yeah, I do believe that the best person should have the job, but I don't believe that mathematically that outcome should ever end up being at the senior level of an organization really skewed because how can it be that people enter an organization and the ratio is 50-50, but by the time you get to the top, it's 85-15, which by the way is generally the statistic that you would have seen up until a few years ago. So I'm pretty proud of where we are. We're not done yet. We're, by the way, we're at 40% of our senior leaders in the bank are women. And uh, we're well over a third of our, our board of directors, and we've got, we've got more work to do on it. So yes, yes, I'm pretty proud of that. But, but as I said, we're not at end of job. Where does climate change fit into this? I mean, you hear about it every day. It's, you know, smart policies, it makes for good business. What's BMO's uh, outlook on uh, the impact of climate change? Yeah, 
it's probably the issue of our of our day. And when you look at the impact on businesses, plural, it's not something that might impact business in five or 10 years. I mean, it's already there. And we see it in so many ways. We have in our asset management business, we have, we have funds based in Europe that are entirely predicated on figuring out ways to mitigate climate change, attract dollars, attract investments against it. So it's real. And it's a big challenge. We've been carbon neutral here for a very long time. And we are trying very hard to direct dollars, large dollars, uh, towards sustainable finance and sustainable energy. So we have a role to play. We're not, we're not bystanders watching this. It's a big deal, as you know. We talked uh, about you know, the world, as I said. Uh, it's really complicated out there these days. You were recently talking about uh, China, you were talking about uh, you know, trade and USMCA, your bank strategy, largely growth is occurring, a big part of it is occurring in, in the United States. What advice do you have for those who are trying to make sense of this world and getting ready to enter a workforce and getting ready to contribute? How would you go about doing that today in a, in, in a place that's just so messy? Yeah, it is messy. And well, let's go to the U.S. first and then we can come back to China, if that makes sense. I've said this before, Goldie. I think the Canadian-U.S. trading relationship is the most successful trading relationship in the history of modern commerce. It's in balance, goods and services. Fundamentals, I'm a big believer that over time, fundamentals prevail. And I think that relationship, you know, over the course of electoral cycles and economic cycles uh, will always be as strong as just about any in the world. That's a prediction I'm very confident in. And like any good family with cousins who like each other most of the time, there are going to be some spats once in a while. But over the course of time, it'll stick together and it'll be extraordinarily strong and both countries will benefit from it as they have for a very long time. When you get outside of North America, of course, it's a more complex equation. But I would say at the end of the proverbial day, I believe there as well that fundamentals do prevail. And... People will act in their mutual best interest ultimately after having gone through a process to get what they finally can convince themselves is the best they can get for themselves. And if you go to trade agreements with China, for example, I'd predict that we will have a trade agreement with China. I won't tell you when. I won't tell you how. I think there'll be lots more volatility between now and then to get there, but I think we absolutely will. Uh, When I say we, I'm speaking for the Americans here. And, you know, I think that we're probably at peak disruption right now in terms of the reversion uh, against globalization. I think what we'll see over the course of time is a return towards a globalist agenda. But we got to get through this, right? And it's going to take a little bit more time and it's going to take some parties to eat a little bit of crow and then we'll be on to the fundamentals, which will drive which will drive the outcomes. Same for China? Yeah, yeah, absolutely same for China. You know, China has been... Uh, um, such a, an important trading partner of Canada's, well, since diplomatic relations were restored in 1970, and it'll continue to be, in my view. Um, but we've got a period here that we've got to get through to get that back on track. And so when I look at China, when I look at the U.S., I don't think in five years from now, we're going to be looking at a situation where we're all sitting in our corner sucking our thumbs. I think we're going to look back and say we've solved some problems and we've moved on. All right. As we come to the end. Let's just do a quick rapid fire on some of these very quickly, just so that I can get them out. Um, How do you relax? You don't, it sounds like. (laughs) You you, you take that long pause as trying to figure out whether there's an answer to your question. No, I I Who's going to call you out on the answer? (laughs) I I try to get a little bit of exercise in every day. So you're not a marathoner, you haven't climbed Mount Kilimanjaro like all these other seals. I'm not not that serious. (laughs) I just try and get a little exercise in every day and I try and hang out with family and friends as much as I could. You look great. How do you learn? Um, asking a lot of questions. What gives you the biggest rush? Solving problems with a group of people. How do you manage stress? Get to the gym. Okay. Now I saw this as the answer already, but you were asked, you know, um, sort of Habs, Leafs, Raptors. TFC. Yeah. What is that? Where does that come from? Look at the name on the field, man. (laughs) I suppose. (laughs) It's fantastic. All right. Look, um, I want to get to a subject that I think is important. And that is that the perception that, you know, people have is what could possibly be wrong in this guy's life? 
anybody I meet with in our membership, it's like, surely to goodness, they've had a straight lineup. It was easy getting to where you got to. There was no adversity in your life. Yet I know that to not be true. You've been through lots of things in your life. Yep. Nobody's had an easy go. In my case, I've been profoundly impacted by an early death in the case of my brother. Uh, cancer took my arguably closest friend. My wife had cancer last year. She had leukemia. Well, I met her and you introduced me to her and she spoke to me about that. That's the reason I'm asking you yeah, this question. For, for, for uh, 10 months. And that was, we had the scare of our lives there. And she's in great shape right now. So it's fantastic. What did you learn about yourself through that? Well, when I said to you earlier, one of the things that I in particular, uh, and I think many people ought to do is breathe, um, is you get a lot of perspective because there are a lot of problems that we try and knock down every day. And we tend to think that they're big problems. When you have a problem like this, you know what a big problem is. And so you focus all your attention on solving that big problem as, as, as a team. I would tell you in our case, our family unit ended up being better off for it as we came through it as a team. And then you go back and look at all these other problems that you previously thought were, were monumental burning fires, yeah. and they're not. They're, they're, ambers. Sure. they're ambers that you can put out on your own. So it does, it does teach you a lot about perspective. She told me you were unbelievable through all of this and that you were a rock and that it happened at a time in which you were literally taking on this role. What did you, like, really, how did you do it? Oh, well, it was, it I mean, was, the kids was at home or she had to yep. be, she had to be yep. away a lot. Yep. Right? You have to do, you have to do two things. You have to establish your priorities and then you have to figure out what your support model is to get behind those priorities. And these are times where in a bit of a geeky way, your business training comes into, comes into play because you develop a plan and you figure out how to execute it. So I knew right away that my priorities were to be with her and uh, she was hospitalized for 33 nights consecutively. And I was there. She reminds me every night but one. Uh, and, uh, and so what did I do to accommodate for that? You have to figure out what your support model is at home. And family. We had family and friends and people who could take over and help us with lots of, lots of driving and things like that. We have three young kids. And at work, I ended up, uh, I was two weeks uh, completely away from work, but with a phone nearby. And I had an unbelievably supportive executive team and board through that period. And then for the two weeks that followed, you know, we were very lucky where we, where we live in Toronto and the, and the resources that we have. You know, I was back and forth to, uh, to a hospital with a, with a two kilometer distance, one, one point to the next. So it was all in the end quite manageable. And then we went through uh, seven months of treatment on an inpatient basis after that and you know, you're called to action, so you figure out how to juggle. But if you don't know what your priorities are in the first place and you don't know how to line up your support model behind it, we wouldn't have done a very good job. Day one, your day ended after a full day. I think you had done media, you'd met your staff, you'd met your clients, and then you went to parent-teacher interviews. How do you do the work-life balance? Man, what you some are, people call man, you work-life are, You are well-researched. You have, <laughs> you have some scary sources. Um, you know what? You have very good people to support you, right? And and I think that the ability to stay organized and stay focused, um, you have to have great people supporting you. I'm very fortunate in that. I have a great staff. And Goldie, it's the same in your job. I know it. You have to say no to a lot of things. Because if you were... No, what's that? <laughs> if you have to say absolutely <laughs> not to a lot of things yeah, because you. the demand exceeds reasonable human supply by a factor of 10, some weeks by a factor of 100. So you have to really understand where your priorities are and what you're not going to do. Now, you mentioned your, uh, your late brother, and I saw you describe him as a role model for you. Tell me why. Because uh, he had an ability to bring people together and to bring an element of compassion and empathy to just about any situation that he walked into that I really had never seen and, and still haven't seen in very many people. Do you mind if I ask what happened? Um, sure, you can ask what happened. It was a tragic accident, actually. My brother was a pilot, and uh, he was flying a plane in, uh, in Africa, and uh, that plane didn't make, its, uh, didn't make its journey that day. So last week, a very similar thing happened to a Canadian pilot in Honduras. How hard is it for you to really have to relive it, given how often these things happen. You never get over these things. Yeah. Um, but you learn to live with it. 
So you sort of think about all the other benefits of your life and whether you've been able to take something positive out of it. But I don't think, I don't think anybody who's gone through things like this could ever say to you, yeah, okay, you know, I'm, I'm over it and these things don't come back. They don't come back. You just figure out how to live with it. Well, something tells me he's living through you. I bet you he's pretty proud of you. Well, that's nice of you to say. All right. You may or may not know this, but we end our podcasts with a little word game. Uh, I say a word and you say the first thing that comes to mind. Oh, I don't know this. This sounds like fun. Yeah. The first thing that comes to mind. First thing that comes to mind. All right. Quebec. Home. Banking. Fantastic. Disruption. Important. Leadership. Critical. Debt. Reasonable to a point. (laughs) That was more than one word. That's all right. Everybody cheats on this one. Uh, Charity. Undervalued. Trump. Entertainment. Family. Most important thing of all. Canada. Wonderful place. Well, you're wonderful. Thank you for doing this. Terrific. Thanks, Goldie. Thanks again to Daryl White of BMO for sharing his story on this episode of Speaking of Business. Subscribe now for more conversations with Canada's top innovators, entrepreneurs, and business leaders. Search Speaking of Business wherever you find podcasts or visit speakingofbiz.ca, that's biz with a Z, to join our email list and follow us on social media. Until next time, I'm Goldie Hyder.